This is mood disorders, part three. If we ask the question, how effective are antidepressant drugs? Well, this figure is showing data from a review study where the review study examined many studies that went in and did the random assignment. Some people are gonna receive the antidepressant, whatever antidepressant drug I'm looking at, and some people are going to receive the placebo. And we're gonna see uh, who, how much improvement is there of the drug over the placebo. Uh, on the x-axis is the initial severity. So the people who are at those lower numbers, they came in with a more mild or moderate depression. And the people who are up at the higher numbers uh, on the x-axis, they came in with a more intense or severe depression to begin with. And then on the y-axis is, is a measure of improvement. And then the little the circles are um, representing the participants in a particular study that received the placebo, and the triangles are um, representing the people who received the drug. The larger the circle or triangle, the more participants who were in the study. And what you'll see is if, if they came in with a kind of mild or moderate depression, uh, there was not significant improvement of the from of the drug over the placebo. It's not until we get into those more severe depressions uh, to start with that they saw um, some significant improvement of the drug over the placebo. There are a number of small confounds within this that one is that the Hamilton depression rating scale is not as reliable for those mild, moderate depressions as we're um, coming in. Uh, and the other is that there is this uh, sometimes we see a kind of spontaneous remission or people get a little bit better uh, just after they go seek help and after they start to make some changes in their lives. We're usually doing that at kind of a low point. Uh, and so we see a, a little bit of a remission often. Your author talks briefly about psychotherapy as an alternative to, to medicine. And I'm going to just summarize what he says here because it's shown to be equally effective for all levels of depression. Um, we see just as much help from psychotherapy as we do from antidepressant drugs with three exceptions. One, drugs work better for dyslimia. People who have that long-term lifelong condition of just kind of unhappy mood, and they're just kind of below the line of, of um, homeostasis and equanimity, they are helped by antidepressant drugs or they tend to be the ones who are likely to be helped. Two, antidepressants are ineffective for sufferers of childhood neglect or abuse. This, there's a lot going into the, um, the stressors and the situation and uh, the assumption, the interpersonal, they need psychotherapy. And I'm not saying that antidepressants with psychotherapy wouldn't be helpful, but antidepressants by themselves are not helping those people. Three, psychotherapy is more likely to reduce relapse months or years later. So people who get on antidepressant drugs, and there's going to be a time most likely when they taper off and come off those drugs, and a lot of those people relapse. Even a lot of people who stay on the drugs, uh, the drugs just stop working as well, and so they tend to relapse. Whereas with psychotherapy, we are learning new ways of thinking, especially if we have some kind of cognitive behavioral therapy, which means we're less likely to relapse as we can um, rely on really new learning for how to deal with some of those interpersonal um, relations. And research shows that really people improve the most with a combination of drugs and psychotherapy. And in the next uh, lecture now, I need to, to end this so it's not too long and I can save it. <laughs> but about overall, about one third to almost one half of patients don't respond to antidepressants or psychotherapy. So we're going to see what we can do for these for this treatment resistant depression. For people who have this treatment resistant depression, so there are about a third of the people who um, with depression who are not helped by either antidepressants or psychotherapy. 
And for those people, they sometimes try electroconvulsive therapy or ECT, sometimes called electroshock therapy. My feelings towards this aren't particularly positive, but I think to some extent it is because um, we're, we're basically causing a seizure in the brain. It's, uh, it seems a bit scary. And historically, it's gotten a pretty bad rap because the way they used to use it was, um, first it was, they did it over both hemispheres. It caused a lot of memory loss and they were really using it for people who were going through some psychosis or who were um, potentially schizophrenic schizophrenics were being given this and it seemed like a way to kind of control people because they'd be kind of out of it for a little while and then they would use it again and again on that on those patients uh, without it really helping the actual without it helping the patient uh, but this has changed all of that the way they administer it uh, who it who receives it all of that has changed to where now the people who receive it are people who are severely depressed who aren't responding to therapy or medication. And I will say that, that my mother has, has seen this done quite a bit as she was working in an alcoholics unit. And if they were also handling kind of a severe depression, this was something they would sometimes try. And um, it, she said that it, she saw people just had a real turnaround uh, after they, were, uh, they received ECT. Uh, now we make sure so people are giving informed consent. That was another piece that wasn't there in the probably in the 50s and 60s, uh, if I remember correctly. But now so the people are signing off and saying, yes, this is something that I want. Uh, usually what happens is they'll uh, administer it about three times a week until we see maximum improvement, which is about six to 12 treatments. Uh, they do use muscle relaxants or anesthetics and they do um, make sure that the something's in the person's mouth and they're not going to uh, bite their tongue. The most common side effect is memory loss, but that was worse when they used to do it across the um, both hemispheres of the brain. Limiting ECT to the right hemisphere appears to lessen this memory loss. That memory loss lasted at most a few months, but sometimes people would, so if you see the there is a high relapse rate, and so ECT is usually supplemented with uh, drugs, uh, therapy, or additional ECT. And so it seemed to me that if you're receiving ECT, having this memory loss, and then a few months later you're relapsing and needing the ECT again, that some of that might be with just the, I feel less depressed because I'm not remembering uh, a lot of the aspects of my life that were depressing me. And, and so that, that seems a little problematic, but a lot of people are helped by this. They'll go through the treatment and then they'll get on some antidepressant drugs and get therapy because they were pretty severely depressed um, and have, having had tried a few things before, but now those things seem to help uh, a lot more with lowering the relapse rate. What's happening with ECT other than other than a seizure in the brain and, and having some memory loss that might help us not remember how miserable we were? <laughs> that's not all that's happening. ECT also increases the proliferation of new neurons in the hippocampus. So we see that same neurogenesis that we saw with antidepressants, but now there is this kind of a bit of not remembering everything that was that was terrible and allowing ourselves to create new connections, as we talked about neurons that fire together, wire together. It, uh, ECT also alters the expression of at least 120 genes in the hippocampus and frontal cortex alone. So if we look at the epigenetic effects, it looks like uh, ECT is having a powerful uh, influence on people. Other therapies, uh, one is they've tried deep brain stimulation and what they've gone in and stimulated is the white matter of the cingulate cortex in both hemispheres so that area where i mentioned i've mentioned that area being really active in people who are well we've talked about it as social pain in when we're in physical pain when we're really miserable here's our cingulate cortex reminding us that we're miserable people with obsessive compulsive disorder it's really active and people with depression they're ruminating. They're thinking about the things they feel guilty about and the things they feel fat, they feel bad about. And so if we stimulate that region, that appears to help. 
regular non-strenuous exercise daily seems to help. I'm going to get back to our exercise. And for seasonal affective disorder, bright light therapy appears to help. So people sitting under uh, a particular kind of lamp that has at least 2,500 lux for more than an hour each day, you can buy these lamps and they can help you through those times when you aren't getting out in the sunlight quite enough. This is really more helpful. So that major depressive disorder or that ha is happening seasonally or what we call seasonal affective disorder, it tends to occur much more as we get into areas where it's very cold and there is not a lot of light during the day. And especially those areas that have maybe four or five hours of sunlight a day in the, in the, mid, in the depths of winter. But I honestly feel like I have some seasonal affective disorder. It was terrible when I lived up in Illinois. It's not as bad in South Carolina, but I still, I do a lot worse in January, February, and March at the end of that winter season than I do at any other time of the year. And my mom did get me a um, bright light uh, lamp that I use, but not as much as I should. And I can't strongly enough uh, talk about the importance of exercise and its role in neurogenesis. So what this picture is showing in A are these various areas of either the hippocampus itself, so the dentate gyrus um, and CA1, or areas that are communicating to the hippocampus like the interrenal cortex. Um, and then in B, it's showing where there, there is more blood flow in the people who were put on this program of aerobic exercise. And as we're getting more blood flow to those areas, we can get more neurogenesis or more, um, more of those neurons staying alive after they are, are created. And aerobic exercise appears to help this about the same percentage of people as antidepressant drugs. I'm going to walk through some of these altered sleep patterns, although we've talked about this now in wake sleep cycles and earlier in major depressive disorders. So I'm going to do it quickly. Teenagers who reported daily problems falling asleep within six to seven years, more than half developed depression. Uh, altered sleep patterns do often precede depression, and they precede depression in time. But as I said, it's not that I have a, a sleep problem and so I'm likely to become depressed so much as if I'm depressed, I have had, I have, I have sleep problems. Uh, one of a pretty common type of problem is that they are, um, for people who have major depressive disorder, is that they are falling asleep quickly. They enter REM sleep very quickly within 45 minutes. They have increased eye movement during REM sleep. And then they also awaken early. So when I say I'm saying early, I mean three, four, five in the morning, and then they cannot get back to sleep. Altered sleep is a lifelong trait in people who are predisposed to depression. And we've talked about the Rohr gene as well and um, not being able to get to sleep, but sleep problems are usually part of depression. I'm going to talk for a little while about bipolar disorder. And this slide basically goes back through that just comparison of unipolar disorder of um, alternating between states of normality and depression versus the bipolar disorder where we see this uh, alternating states between uh, depression and something more like mania. And I have I distinguished earlier between bipolar one and bipolar two. So I'm not going to go back through that. Each one is affecting approximately 1% of the population. One thing I like to show, I don't think this is from your book, but I like this figure a lot, as a picture is worth a thousand words, as the brain's use of glucose increases during periods of mania and decreases during periods of depression. So normally what we see, if you remember what we've seen so far in our brains, in our look, when we've looked at brain activity, there's been a lot of green, there's been a lot of green and yellow, and when something's really happening somewhere, we might see some yellow and red, and when we see something really not happening somewhere, we see blue. And this is a bipolar, this, these are PET scans of a person with bipolar disorder. May 17th, 83, they have depression. May 27th, 83, they have depression. May 18th of 1983, 
they have um, the mania part of that. And you can see a lot of blue in the states of depression, that there's just a lot, there's less brain activity overall in comparison to the quote normal brain. But when we look at what's happening with um, people who are in their manic stage, I sometimes refer to this as brain on fire. There are areas that are red. <laughs> there are areas that are yellow and red showing a lot of activity. And that frontal area, I'm assuming, is at least including the anterior cingulate cortex. To just roll through some of the genetics, the genetic predisposition is supported by twin studies and by adoption studies. Uh, for identical twins, we see concordance rates as high as uh, 40 to 70 percent, depending on the study, those estimates. There is a significant overlap in the susceptibility uh, for bipolar disorder as for schizophrenia. And no one gene has a strong relationship or we can't point to a gene and say this is going to be um, predictive of having bipolar disorder. I'm going to go through the treatments for bipolar disorder. I'm going to start with lithium, which I think if you've been introduced to bipolar disorder and have heard much about it, you've probably heard about lithium. It is the most common uh, medical treatment for bipolar disorder. And I'm going to go through the story of how it was discovered because I find it fascinating that anybody would discover anything in this manner and I uh, find it kind of impressive as well. So back in, I think it was 1949, John Cade, uh, he was a chemist who was doing animal studies. And so he was working with guinea pigs and he gave the guinea pigs urine from people who had bi bipolar disorder. And the urine had a toxic effect on the guinea pigs. The guinea pigs died. So it appeared to be the uric acid that was in the urine. And so he took uric acid and he was um, putting that into a solution to check that. And it wasn't dissolving well, so he added lithium uh, to help the uric acid to dissolve. He gave that to the guinea pigs and the guinea pigs were fine. And so then he gave the urine again, urine from people who had bipolar disorder to the guinea pigs, and the guinea pigs were fine. It appeared that the lithium urate uh, had a protective effect for the guinea pigs. And so now normally we would, um, if we, we were at animal trials, and especially these days, you'd have to go through a lot of, uh, of uh, various studies, getting permissions, um, defending, the idea that this might be safe actually for humans as well but what john cake did back in the day was uh he just tried the lithium urate himself and he was fine and so then he tried it on he had 14 patients who had bipolar disorder and all all 14 of those patients uh calmed down they didn't, weren't going through those manic phases and so that is how we discovered that lithium really calms down the the manic depression that uh, those uh, severe mood swings so uh lost my train of thought there for a second and i don't want to start this again because i've already started a couple times <laughs> this that whole story of lithium is is a bit much and so if you go back to um the day when i had the line across that was kind of like a line across time and uh, I kind of put the line across as being kind of meh. <laughs> I think I got quoted on that. Um, but it, we can think of that as also maybe a little bit more positively, as I said in an earlier slide, maybe something more like equanimity. We don't really have the highs and lows. Normally, we have normal highs and lows, right? We have times when we're having more fun and life is more enjoyable. And we have times when we're in a bad mood and, and things aren't perfect. And we're like, that's OK, because it's, it's going to I'm going to have another decent time soon. Uh, well, for people on lithium, they're really at that line. And it's not so much a sense of equanimity. It is more a sense of, of meh. Like they're just not having the kind of emotion. They're not having those emotions that I think to some extent are really enjoyable. And especially because there are these pleasant emotions. And so keeping them on their medication 
is difficult. So I'm going to skip down there to the cognitive behavioral therapy or other kinds of psychotherapy are often added to uh, just taking a medication. Just taking a medication does not have the same kind of outcome as also getting some kind of therapy. And often that therapy is to convince them to stay on their medication, to remind them about the, the bad times and the trouble they've gotten themselves into or what's that doing, what that is doing to their interpersonal relationships, that they have people who love them and care about them and that they need to really stay on that medication. If lithium uh, doesn't work or if they won't stay on the lithium because it is just not fun, uh, another thing that they use sometimes is anticonvulsants. Okay, so valproate, depakote, and depakine, or depakine are the ones I guess I have heard more about. They are usually used for people with epilepsy. And if I remember correctly, all of those are working on the GABA system. Uh, I'm going to say this wrong. Carbamazepine, that's it, carbamazepine. I know less alike less about and I think that it's working on both GABA and uh, glutamate. We do see sometimes that they put them on antidepressants. Uh, again, this, and I think I said before about these two, this can be risky as we can bring them out of that depression, but they can get into uh, more of a manic state. And so that's that can be problematic. If they're in more of a manic state, and especially if they go to a state hospital or something in that state, they're pretty likely to be put on antipsychotics or people try them on antipsychotics. And here they're having the same kind of side effects that we see antipsychotics have uh, with people who have schizophrenia. But now in this case, they also aren't, um, they're not dealing with really the, the mood swings. I'm going to finish up with these treatments. I first want to just come back to that. I clicked off of there before coming back to the, that, having cognitive behavioral therapy or some kind of therapy in conjunction with the medication is really helpful uh, more so i think for bipolar disorder than maybe almost any other disorder i don't know that that's true but i'm gonna <laughs> but as i'm here it just seems so important um, if we look at the drugs uh, at the medications and the mechanisms by which they are working uh, for lithium and for some of the anticonvulsants we see that they are decreasing glutamate activity by decreasing the number of AMPA receptors in the hippocampus. Uh, lithium blocks the synthesis of the brain chemical arachidonic acid. So this is a chemical that is produced during brain inflammation. Uh, we also see arachidonic acid um, being blocked or counteracted by omega-3 fatty acids. And especially in our kind of American diet, where we tend to get a lot more omega-6s and omega-9s, and some of this is really about the ratio, but it, it looks like, and I'm going to show on the next slide, the kind of environmental factor that those omega-3s that we can get from um, those small fish, from fish oil, from avocados, there are, there are many different ways to get omega-3 fatty acids into just your diet, but that is also helpful for um, people with bipolar disorder. Another thing that is extremely helpful is a consistent sleep schedule. And sometimes they also are, like people with major depressive disorder, they do have just problems sleeping. Um, so this isn't as easy as it sounds, but a consistent, being consistent with the sleep schedule can help a lot and it helps to reduce the intensity of those mood swings. My final piece of talking about bipolar disorder is just to come back to this idea of the importance of omega-3s and the possible effect of diet, which diet in general is something to keep in mind of keeping a healthy diet. And some of those uh, sugars and unhealthy fats can are really bad for the brain in many ways. But this is a this is a figure that is showing um, across different countries and cultures, which there are lots of compounds, but I'm going to show it anyway. These places like um, Korea and Iceland that where they eat a great deal of seafood. So if we're looking on the x-axis, this is how much seafood they're eating. And then on the y-axis, it's the likelihood of having a bipolar, um, a, bi of having bipolar disorder or having a manic stage. Uh, we get less and less bipolar disorder the more seafood we're eating. 
uh, across countries. Again, very confounded. A lot goes into those kind of those uh, what's what's happening in a particular country. But if you were looking across a lot of countries there, and the more seafood we're eating, the less bipolar disorder we're seeing. Okay, that's my ending here, and we will talk about we will talk about schizophrenia on Friday.